Hey, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning to everyone that's managed uh, to join today. Um, for those that um, do not know me, my name is uh, Billy McDermott. I am the product lead here at Redsift on our ASM and on our certificate uh, product. I'm delighted um, to be talking to you today. Um, I am going to talk about the undiscovered country and how you can unmask and mitigate the perils of asset misconfigurations with Redshift ASM. Um, uh, if you do have any questions as we go along, uh, do let me know. You can use the chat feature uh, that's built into Livestorm. More than happy to answer any questions um, that do come up as we go. And we'll be running, I think, for about 20 to 30 minutes. But this is an interactive session. I am not just going to be showing you slides. I am going to be showing you a demonstration of Redshift ASM and Redshift certificates today. And yes, for those um, who noticed the deliberate Star Trek reference in there, it is, um, it is intentional. Um, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it already, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered uh, Country. So what am I going to talk about um, today? Five, um, five points. First of all, I want to touch on the expanding um, attack surface and the assets that should actually um, concern you. What should you be looking at and what um, are the assets that could result um, in uh, misconfigurations um, impacting your estates. We'll do a bit of a dive um, into those risks, what um, um, they are, and actually what could the impact be of those misconfigurations um, that exist on the particular asset types. I'll then talk about um, the automatic and continuous and um, proactive proactive methods that Redsim, Redsift ASM and Redsift certificates use um, as part of the Redsift uh, platform to help you um, avoid those misconfiguration issues. And then we will talk a little bit at the end about how you can get started with Redsift ASM. Okay, the undiscovered country, as I said. What do I mean by the undiscovered country? Well, what I mean is the assets that are out on the public internet that you as a security team have got no visibility of. Um, these are the assets that um, the various teams across your business are actually creating every single minute of every single day. And that you as a security team, because of the, the limited and finite resources that you have, whether that's limited and finite uh, people resources, whether that's limited um, and finite tooling, um, um, or whether it's just that actually you, you haven't identified the right tooling yet. These are the assets that are out there um, that you don't know about, that you cannot track. And that's an ever expanding surface. Um, but importantly as well, and I want to talk, just, just mention this, and, and this is a great book, by the way, Rick Howard, Cybersecurity First Principles. Um, I want to make it clear what we, we we talk about at Redshift DSM and Redshift certificates <clears throat> is you can't fix everything. Okay, this quote always rings true. I want to spend my finite resources on protecting material things, not protecting Luigi's lunch menu. Okay, there are things within your estate that you should be looking at. There are things in your estate that you should be trying to protect um, and there are things that are less important to you and you cannot fix everything. You need to be um, putting the resources on those assets that are most likely to cause you reputational harm, that are most likely to cause you financial harm, that are most likely to actually lose your business. However, that said, one point on this statement is you should still have visibility of Luigi's lunch menu, okay? You should still know that there are assets out there that could be a potential risk. It's just that you may not want to spend time actually remediating those. And that's just an important thing to talk about. We don't say to you fix everything. We help you to identify the assets that should be fixed. And what assets should concern you? What are the assets that you don't know about that you should be looking at? Here's what's important within your estate. Okay, you should be looking at domains, 
you should be looking at subdomains, you should be looking at certificates, you should be looking at IP addresses, and you should be looking at cloud resources. Okay, this is where people, processes, and technology, to use that old adage, absolutely collide because the more people, more people within organizations than ever before can create all these different asset types. Let's take domains. Okay, for example, there are domains in most organizations that have been registered, that have been created by teams and security have got no visibility. That could be marketing teams, for example. They may have access to registrars um, and they may have their own accounts for registrars that you don't know are actually um, in use. It's something we see regularly. Even engineering teams could be registering domains without the knowledge of the security team and they could be registering domains with your brand names co um, contained within them and that can be a, a risk and i'm going to talk about that in a second in more detail subdomains similar they're created from multiple different sources for multiple different reasons that's engineer not just engineering teams now but can mainly be engineering teams but think about your finance teams your finance teams <clears throat> your HR teams, they're using um, third party applications and they may have created or ha asked someone to create DNS records that are actually pointing to those third party services. So have a think about that. Um, distributed teams are having a massive impact on subdomains and often subdomains though are often temporary they're often often ephemeral um they may not last a, a long time so it's important to understand that subdomains can exist just for a very short period of time certificates certificates come from different sources that are issued by multiple different CAs. Um, you've got private PK, uh, PKI that, that is often found on the public internet, is out in the wild. And this problem is becoming um, larger because of automation. You know, the, uh, the, the CAs are, are pitching automation as correctly, correctly the, right, the right thing. But more automation means more volume. And when you combine that with short certificate lifespans, um, you, your problem is becoming bigger. Your attack surface is increasing um, all the time. Um, exact same thing, to be honest, when it comes to IP addresses. And you've got another complexity there, which well can happen with other assets as well. But often IP addresses that you're pointing to They've got your services running on them, but they are completely owned and completely managed by third parties that are out with your control. And then finally, asset types, cloud resources, um, really interesting area, very concerning area, particularly because for you as a security team, often cloud resources are created with no way of actually identifying if they belong to your organization or not. So out in the wild, on the internet, there are tons of cloud resources out there that are just using the, admit, the default administration names given to them by GCP or by Azure or AWS that you can't find by just doing normal, you know, using normal discover, discovery methods, okay? Um, they do not have any of your domain names contained within them. They've got no reference to them and there's no breadcrumbs that could, could lead, you, lead you to there. Again, they're often ephemeral. They, they often, IP addresses in particular from cloud, uh, for cloud resources, don't last that long sometimes, they do change on a daily basis. Okay, so those are the five asset types that we, we think you should be looking at and it's what I'm going to focus on on today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about four of those asset types in a little bit more detail and I'm going to talk about the key low-hanging fruit issues that we see every single day with our customers and then i'm going to talk about how red Shift asm and red Shift certificates can help you solve those i'm going to talk about domains first of all fantastic book i'm going to talk about books quite a lot today because i have lots of books and i like reading so this is mark jeftovich's book sorry for the clumsy pronunciation managing mission critical domains and dns highly recommended reading um superb resource for picking up and, and reading into to this area and he states early on, the most common cause of domain name and DNS unplanned outage is the unintentional domain expiry. <clears throat> okay, what he means by that is that people are letting 
domain names act domain name registrations expire, whether that's deliberately, okay? Maybe they didn't realize that there were services associated with it. Or maybe it's a domain name that was registered by someone in the team and someone didn't know that it was actually due to expire. And this is um, backed up by some statistics here in 2022. Um, the number of domains that are re-registered is very low. It's 29%. Um, the number of domains that were actually renewed is very low at 29.8%. The number of domains that are actually expired um, really high, 41.2% of domains are being left to expire. Okay, You should never allow a domain name with any type of marginal value um, expire. Um, it is a risk or maybe services running on it. And there are proactive tools out there that are going out finding domains that are due to expire soon, keeping an eye on the, the expiration date, and then trying to back order it. So if you work for an organization, okay, um, where your domains are important to you because it's your brand name, and arguably that's every single organization, um, you should be monitoring your domains proactively for expirations. Don't rely on your registrar to do that. Okay, there's many reasons why, but first of all, what you think is your only registrar may not be your only registrar. Okay, like I said, other team members may be registering domains with other registrars that you do not actually know about. All right, so you can't rely on just registrar monitoring. You should be having tooling in place that goes out and finds all of the domains that may belong to you using a number of different discovery methods. And I will demonstrate that in a moment. <clears throat> Second asset type, subdomains. Okay. Biggest risk here that we see, one of the, 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 the low hanging fruit things that are easy to fix if you've got the right tooling in place are subdomains uh, that are affected by dangling, also known as orphaned DNS issues. Okay. Um, there's a fantastic bit of research out there from Certitude Consulting. Um, it was recently uh, recently um, put put out there by by Florian Schweister. Um, please do look it up. It's a really bit of interest in reading with some fascinating numbers against it. But if you don't know what dangling or orphan DNS means, here's what it means in reality. Um, First of all, your DNS configuration may be pointing to a service that might be a cloud service, it might be a marketing service, it may be a finance service. It may have been something that has been genuinely used for a number of years. And then someone decides that they're not going to use it anymore. It may be um, uh, a market, a piece of marketing software. For example, something like MailChimp or uh, Unbounce campaign monitor. And then uh, the marketing team decides actually they're not going to use that tool anymore. So the service is deprecated. OK, um, look at that line there for, from Florian. OK, affected organizations cannot be sure that all their cloud providers implement protections. OK, so if the team that's using that service deprecates it, um, you cannot be sure that the cloud provider themselves is also deprecating that service. And as importantly, you cannot be sure that they are securing that service so that no one else is able to take that service over. So you need to, when you're deprecating a service, you need to remove it from DNS. However, that's quite difficult to keep up with. It's difficult to do unless you've got a very good manual inventory of what DNS has been configured and what services are being pointed to, uh, uh, what the uh, what services the DNS is pointing to. You, you, you won't be able to keep up with it. Therefore, what we see, and we see this with big organizations, um, both private and public sector, with thousands okay, of instances where the DNS isn't updated, resulting in a dangling or orphaned DNS situation. And um, that puts you at risk okay, of the service being taken over. What that means is that you will have a subdomain that's owned by your organization pointing to a service that has been taken over by an attacker, okay? That means that they can publish a website, okay, with your name, with your brand, and that's a misrepresentation of what you do, okay? So that's a really key issue with this particular asset type. 
Next, I'm going to move on to certificates. Okay, um, Ivan Rishtik, um, the, the founder of Red Sift ASM um, and certificates, um, has written a fantastic book, uh, Bulletproof TLS and PKI. Um, and in that, he talks about certificate transparency. Certificate transparency has been a wonderful um, change for the internet. Okay, it's a central log of every single um, certificate that's been issued to the public internet. And that's the only, if that uh, certificate is on certificate transparency logs, that's the only way the internet can trust that certificate. So it's a fantastic deterrent, it's a fantastic way for the internet to check, can I actually trust that certificate? But what it doesn't do, okay, is prevent misissuance. Just before I move on to the next slide, uh, we can give you a complimentary copy uh, by PDF of Bulletproof TLS and PKI. And please do um, send, uh, send an email to us and we will get that sent out to you uh, by email as soon as we possibly can. But what issues can misissuance actually result in? Issuing, issuance and misissu misissuance together, Dif two difficult words today to say, so uh, sorry for slipping up with that. Um, but man in the middle attacks um, can actually occur um, and with a misissuance. And here's our, our very recent example. Um, actually, you can see that this blog uh, was recently updated on, on the, the 3rd of November. And um, the, the scenario here is a man, of, man in the middle attack came from um, someone issuing a certificate for a domain that, that didn't belong to them. Um, in this case, the, man, the, the attacker managed to issue um, multiple certificates via um, the Certificate Authority Let's Encrypt for um, two domains for jabber.ru and for xmpp.ru. Um, and this, this happened um, from earlier in the year, actually. It happened from, from April. Um, that then meant that they could um, deliver, a, take a I sorry, carry out a, a man in the middle attack. Um, they were able to intercept traffic from the researchers, say, from at least the 21st of July, 2023. Now, the only way that this attack was eventually detected was is that the attacker actually failed to renew um, the certificates that were actually um, expired. This happened because people weren't monitoring the certificates that were being issued for those domains, okay? Um, they weren't paying attention and they didn't understand that despite the protections that, um, despite the protections that the, um, uh, the, the CT monitoring actually offers, despite the protections that the other, you know, um, policies do do offer that that are available, you should still monitor every single certificate that is issued with your name um, on it. Okay, so that's one of the biggest risks that come with certificates, um, um, and it's one of the many reasons why you should be monitoring every certificate, every certificate that's issued, and I'll talk about how we can do that for you in a second. And then the final resource type here, cloud resources. Um, there's a fantastic survey, actually, that, that came out not too long ago by HashiCorp, a um, great organisation, um, State of the Cloud Strategy, and um, Brilliant quote, 86% of high maturity companies said they were implementing or expanding or planning multi-cloud environments. Okay, um, that means that people aren't just using GCP. They aren't just using all of those different resource types that are listed on that developer cheat sheet from GCP. But it also means that people are using GCP and also using AWS and, also, and using Azure and other there are other cloud providers available that might be um, ibm cloud it might be um, alibaba cloud tons of other options available but the fact remains <clears throat> the vast majority of, majority of organizations if they're not if they don't have multi-cloud environments now they soon will have and the multi-cloud environment more multi-cloud environments that exist the more cloud resources um, that exist as well um, your cloud resources these are um, compute instances these are storage buckets these are load balancers all these different things that are actually required to make applications work in the cloud have a distinct presence um, on the internet and as i said 
earlier, sometimes they're really hard to actually detect because they aren't issued with any of your company's names. They aren't issued with your domain names. But it's really important to actually track them because of examples like this. This was a, a CVE from uh, that, that Confluence um, issued um, in, in 2022. Um, actually, I was talking to, to a customer about this specific vulnerability um, uh, uh, some time ago. Um, they weren't initially aware um, that they had any Confluence instances um, still running within their environment within uh, when the CV was actually issued. Um, but it turned out upon further investigation that they were, and it took quite a while for them to, to find them, they were actually able to identify that they did have some confluences, confluence instances running. The way they were able to do that eventually but was by identifying some load balancers that were actually pointing um, to the the application instances now it took them a long time to actually um actually find find those instances and it turned out they were actually impacted um you know by the cve as a as a result of it if they had had immediate visibility um somehow of those load balances then it would have sped up the, the time to identification um, of of this 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 vulnerability with within their estate, and actually it, they are one of the main reasons why we enhanced recently our cloud integrations feature so that we do give visibility of cloud resources. So within that customer's account now, they can now see um, all of the load balancers as well as the other cloud resources uh, cloud resources types. So that means when a CVE does come up they can quickly find um any potential cloud resources that could be impacted and i'll talk more about that um, in a second so <clears throat> what i've done there is i've covered off different um types of issues that come up can come up that are very specific to those asset types of course that isn't all encompassing of course there are lots and lots of other misconfigurations that that can happen um, but we do only have half an hour in these webinars um so we don't talk about everything but what i'll do is I'll, I'm, I'm going to just run through um um asm red Shift asm and red Shift certificates uh, and i'm going to demonstrate how we can help you identify those asset types so that you can start to think about how you could mitigate um, the, the potential risks and more that I've identified and spoken about um, during, during these slides. What I will say now, just while I remember, um, if you want to if you're concerned um, about these misconfigurations, if you want to talk to us and talk about how we do do this, then do get in touch. Okay, go to the Red Sif website, um, book a book a session with one of our one of our sales engineers, and we'll be happy to to talk about your concerns and talk about how we can help you identify it. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about um, Red Sif DSM. And I'm going to talk about Red Sif certificates. This demo, we've got about seven minutes left, so this will be a quick demo, but as I said, we'll do a deep dive with you if you do book a session with one of our engineers. So what you can see here um, is our demo environment. We've got an inventory of um, domains, hosts, certificates, and IP addresses, those asset types that I was talking about. And there's also in here, there's an inventory of cloud resources, which I'll show you um, in a second. This is automatically and continuously kept up to date. So we find, no matter the registrar, we find domains that belong to your organization and add them to your inventory. We find hosts, okay, that belong to you and add them to your inventory automatically, often in real time. We find certificates that belong to you and add them to your inventory and find them in real time. And we find IP addresses that belong to you and add them to your inventory. We automatically monitor the expiration dates okay, of your domains so that you don't have to. This means that you can avoid that very common problem that I spoke about, which is domains register and um, domains expiring without you knowing about it. Okay, <clears throat> We do this through our issues module. That's a work in progress. And very soon you will get email alerts about any domains in your account 
that have not been renewed and are due to expire. But what you can see here is everything is in one place. Okay, this unified view of your estate okay, means that not only can you see all of the domains, but importantly, you can see are there actually any other assets associated with that domain? That helps you speed up the time to, to triage. You can decide whether this is important or not. To put it in, in, in the words of Rick Howard, as I mentioned earlier, is this Luigi's menu or is it something more important than, than Luigi, Luigi's menu? So, for example, I can see we've got redsift.tech here. I can see that there are 37 domains and three uh, subdomains and three certificates. That to me tells me that's something that's in use by the organization and is probably um, important. It's probably something that we should be looking at. If I then click through, I can see all the subdomains, we call them hosts within Redshift ASM. And what you can see is a red, amber, green system that tells you about the configuration of those assets. I'm going to talk specifically about dangling DNS and orphaned DNS. If there is a dangling DNS issue, then we will create an issue to tell you about it. So you can see here, this is a QA environment, so this is all tests. We have got dangling domain names within here. If I then click through to the issue, we give you all the information that you need to actually triage and begin remediating that um, dangling DNS issue. So this is all about getting you information about the assets that you care about um, as soon as an issue comes up. And this is continuous. This will update automatically every day without you having to update it. It goes without saying, we have got an excellent API. Um, we have had amazing feedback, particularly recently from our customers on our API. It's incredibly easy to use. So if you do have a tech stack um, within your SOC that you want to ingest all this data into, really easy to do. And our sales engineers and our superb customer success team will help you do that, will help you build that integration. Red SIF certificates, and uh, this is how we build inventory of all the certificates that belong to you. But to avoid or help you mitigate the risks that come with misissuance, every time a new certificate is discovered on the internet, we will add it to your, in, um, your, your inventory and we will send you an email notification to tell you about it. We can also set some rules called, uh, we call them CT monitoring rules because it ties into the information that we get from certificate transparency logs. So for example, you can receive an escalation if a certificate is issued by a certificate authority, okay, that um, doesn't actually belong to you. So let's say you are a DigiCert, DigiCert shop, you get all your certs issued from DigiCert, you could set an alert to say, if I receive, if a cert is issued with our name on it, that comes from any other certificate authority, then I get uh, an escalation. Okay, so that helps you to take a look at what certs are actually being issued um, and where they're actually coming from. And then finally, through our integrations with GCP, with AWS and with Azure, we can give you complete visibility of all the cloud resources that we actually detect. So what you can see here, if I pick the tag AWS, this automatically will show me all the cloud resources that have been found uh, within the AWS account. That connects daily any new assets, so whether they're host names, IP addresses, are imported and added into your harmonized inventory. So um, what I've covered off there is how RedSift certificates and RedSift ASM can help you avoid um, those specific issues that come with those specific asset types. As I mentioned, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more configuration problems that, that can occur. Um, so here, you know, here's a data sheet it explains a little bit more uh, about about what we do in both sides of the product. As I mentioned, if you do want to get in touch, if you are interested in trying us out and talking to to us more about how we can help you, then go to the website, click on talk to an expert, and someone will be in touch with you straight away. As I mentioned as well, if you'd like a complimentary copy of Bulletproof, then please do email us and we'll get that sent out to you um, as well. So we're just at time. 
thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a bit of a flying run through. Um, I hope you found that interesting. As I said, my name is Billy McDermott. Do connect with me on LinkedIn. Do say hello um, if, you, if you need anything. And if you are interested, get in touch and we'll set up a, a call with you to tell you more um, about what we do. Thank you very much for your time.